So good morning and welcome to Long Hill Chapel. My name is Michael Hadi. I am the lead pastor here. I'm so glad you're with us on this last day of 2023. What a year it has been for so many of us in so many different ways. But we're here and uh, this is that weird week where it's, it's kind of the, it's after Christmas, but it's not the new year yet. And it still feels a little like Christmas, but it doesn't. We are those people who like leave our lights, our Christmas lights up and on as long as we possibly can. Uh, Joey asked me this morning, he's like, should we light the candles? I'm like, yes, because Christmas is not officially over yet. So uh, that is why we did that, and we uh, are definitely hanging on to Christmas as long as possible. But we today come to the end of our Christmas series. We uh, today come to the end of a series that we have been going through, which has quite simply been the story of Christmas. It's been the story that we find in the Gospel of Luke from the very beginning to the very end. Something that I think happens very often is it's a story that we've he heard pieces of and we're very familiar with in some ways, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of nuance to it when you go from the beginning to the end. And so that's what we've been doing. And one of the things that kind of marks that is that there are these songs that occur in the story. Uh, where it looks like when you're reading the, the Bible text that it, it breaks into song lyrics, and it's actually because there are four songs in the Christmas story uh, that were sung by the early church, and they were uh, reminding themselves of what was true in the midst of difficult circumstances. And so that's really what we've been talking about, is how those apply to us today, how they apply to us here in 2023, almost 2024, give it another day, and there we will be. Uh, but we are on the very last part of that today with a part of the Christmas story, uh, which is not something we spend a lot of time on and a character we don't talk a whole lot about. I don't know if you've ever had anything in life that you got it and, it, and time brought value to it. Like the longer you kept it, uh, the more value it had. Uh, I have this funny story. Some of you, we live in the, kind of the finance capital of the United States. And so there's a lot of people who work in finance. Uh, I'm the worst investor ever. Uh, but back in the financial crisis, I had a, a friend who was like, you know, now's the time you should get into stocks because everything was really low. And so I opened a brokerage account. And this is like, like when your three-year-old starts to ride a bicycle, it's that kind of uh, financial investor status. That's about where I am. Uh, but I opened this account and I bought a few shares of a few different tech stocks, and then I ignored it uh, for like the next five years. And then I happened to figure out my log into my brokerage account, and I went in, and suddenly this thing that I had invested in for this very small amount of money was worth substantially more. Now, this, I, didn't go, I, like, I didn't go all in, I just took a little bit of money and threw it in, and, and there was this tremendous return that, that I experienced and I'm still experiencing, and it's one of those things that I wish I could go back and do more of. And some of you have those things where there was this opportunity that you had that came along and you're like, you put your toe into it, but you didn't really put your whole foot into it. And you wish you had done that. You know, there's, there's places in our lives that we have uh, in, where we look back and say, you know, I wish I hadn't hedged my bets. I wish I hadn't let some circumstance or I hadn't let fear or I hadn't let the opinions of other people get the best of me. You know, sometimes you have to commit your life to things that involve waiting to see the fruit of them come around. And, and here's what this is not. Here's what we're not going to talk about. This is not like this moralistic, the best things come to those who wait kind of story. You, you didn't need to come to church for that. You could have figured that out on the internet all by yourself. But there's something that I want to talk about today that I think we miss and we misunderstand because it's not just the fruit of waiting where we start to see value emerge. There's actually something that happens in the waiting itself. There's something that happens in the process of waiting. There's something that happens that we experience, or at least that we can experience, as we wait for things in our lives that I believe God actually has put there on purpose. How many of you like to wait? 
None of us, especially here. Nobody likes the wait. This is why we love microwaves. This is why we love DoorDash. We don't have to wait in lines anymore. I discovered ShopRite Shop from Home back in the pandemic. Like if I go inside another grocery store at any point in my life ever again, it will be a bad day. Because you can just like show up and some nice person comes out and puts the stuff in your car and you leave. It's the most amazing thing ever. We hate to wait. But today, we come to the end of our Christmas series, those four songs of Christmas, and we come to the end of a year, and we're looking back, some of us, and we're looking ahead. Some of you do this. I'm kind of a reflective person, so I do it. And there's these places in our lives that don't feel like they've resolved yet, where we feel like we're in the waiting, where even though the year is ending, the thing isn't ending. Even though we're looking ahead to the new year, we don't see the fruit of our lives, the fruit of the thing we've been holding out for, that we've been praying for, that we've been hoping for, however you want to fill in that blank. And so that's what I want to really talk about today. And so we're going to read from the end of the Christmas story, from the Gospel of Luke, beginning uh, in chapter 2 at verse 22. And it goes like this. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, there are no Christmas songs written about this section, by the way. Joseph and Mary took him, and that's Jesus, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Uh, one real quick sidebar here. That's actually not the sacrifice that most people offered when they presented a child to the Lord. The sacrifice was actually a lamb. But this was a sacrifice. You could, you could substitute birds for the lamb in, in, in the Israelite custom if you were very poor. And so we get a little bit of a picture of the story of Joseph and Mary and Jesus. That These are not people who have a lot of means. And in fact, this whole experience has stretched them incredibly. And so that's just a sidebar. We go on. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. What's the consolation of Israel? It's the promise of Messiah. It's the promise of the one who would come, who would redeem the people. Remember at this point, Israel is occupied. It's oppressed by the Roman Empire. It's been that way for a long time, and things don't seem like they're going to get any better. The story goes on. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts when the parents brought the, in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, and here's the fourth song of the series, by the way, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him, then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. She was just married for a little bit, and then she was a widow for a very long time. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. And so we have a few different characters here. We have Jesus and Mary and Joseph, you know, the, 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 the family that we've sung about, that we've talked about, that the Christmas story is all about. But then we have a couple of other characters, Simeon, and we have this prophetess, Anna. And both of them have been waiting for a very long time. Now, in the first week of our series, we talked about the fact that by this point... There were not a lot of people in Israel who were like really looking forward to the Messiah coming and setting things right. Because hundreds of years had passed. 
I think the analogy I used is it was 400 years, and so it was this distance of time, like if we were to go back 400 years, it would be when William Shakespeare was alive or some of the explorers. And so it's this distant past thing when the last time happened that anyone had heard from God, there had been any prophets, there had been any angels, there had been anyone speaking. And so at this point, life was just kind of going on and everybody, they loved the story and it made them feel a little bit better, but there were very few people at that time who were actually like, yeah, this is the thing that's going to happen. It's going to happen any moment because time had passed. Because the prayers that they had prayed, the hopes of the nation, it had been a very long time. But there were a handful of folks, and most people thought they were just a little bit crazy. They're the kind of people who, like, they'd say, like, yes, we are expecting the Messiah is going to come, and everyone would kind of nod and smile, but it would be that sort of pain smile. You're like, you know, a step away quietly kind of smile. It's, it's, it's that kind of thing. That's how a lot of people saw people like Simeon and Anna. But both of them have been holding on to this hope, not just like, you know, not, not just as part of their lives, but as their whole life. Simeon literally is staying alive so he can see this. Anna, very early in her life, experienced tremendous, profound loss. For a woman in that culture to lose her husband was a, it's a substantial blow in any time. But it was basically the end of any kind of meaningful life she would have. And so she has this tremendous hole that opens up in her life. And rather than just sit there in the moment and sit there with the pain and with the desolation, she fills it with purpose. She commits herself to prayer and to fasting for the Messiah, for the one who is going to come. You know, a couple back in another church that I served at about a decade ago, uh, there was a single man who was in his 80s uh, who I got to know, and uh, we, he would come to prayer meetings that we would have, and he was just like this normal guy you'd talk to, but then he would start praying. And he would pray for revival and renewal in the church, and he'd pray for it in his heart. And it was like it was the first time he was praying those prayers. You know, here's a guy who's been at this for a long, long time. He's been at life for a long, long time. He's seen a lot of things, but his prayers were so fervent and they were so powerful. And he put him, his whole self into it because that's what his life had been built around. And so friends, as you go into a new year, as you bid 2023 farewell with either you know, great glee seeing it go off into the distance you know, or with, with great fondness for what's happened. Some of you, there's something that God has spoken into your life that seems like it's totally not working out in the present circumstances. There's this thing that you believe is from God that you have that you don't see how it's working out. I want to encourage you to hold on to that thing, to hold on to that prayer that you have. Some of you have been praying for a child. You've been praying for a relationship. You've been praying for a circumstance to change, and it just doesn't seem like it is. Hold on to that. Because God's sense of time is longer than our sense of time, and there's something that happens in the waiting. Maybe there's something that God has given you to pray for, literally until it hurts, or until it seems pointless. Don't stop doing that. Here's another thing, and I think we see this in the life of Anna. Maybe your life right now feels like you're searching for a purpose. You know, this is that week between Christmas and New Year's, and if you're anything like me, it's the week where everyone's like, which way is up? Like, what, what's going on? Uh, like, we, our families watch way too many late night movies and eating way too many cookies. But you just, you're kind of discombobulated. It's this discombobulated sense that we, we have in this week. It's, you know, the big holiday is over. The new year is coming. We'll figure it out about the second or third weekend, hopefully. But it's this, this weird time in the middle. Maybe your life actually feels like that all the time. There's a chance that you have. There's an opportunity that you have. There's a space that's been created in your life that you're waiting for something to fill, and maybe this is your opportunity to fill it with something. Maybe it's your opportunity to fill it with something. 
I can imagine Anna, after her husband died, way back there, way all those 80 years ago, or however long it had been, she'd been like, okay, I don't know what to do. My life is effectively over. Instead, what she does is she does something on purpose. There's this space that she has that's actually been created by loss, and she fills it with God. She doesn't fill it with things. She doesn't even fill it with her own circumstances. She fills it with God. What if God is calling you in that discombobulated space that you feel to fill that space in some way with him? Now, here's the thing. Tomorrow is the new year. Happy new year, all of us, if we make it to midnight tonight. And I think all of us a little bit, we like the energy of a new year because it gives us momentum, right? It's like it's a new thing, so it's time to start a new habit. Some of you have New Year's resolutions. I won't tell you the statistics on how well those work out because I don't want to depress you. But if you think about it effectively, January 1st isn't all that different. It's just another day. It's just another trip around the sun. It's The change is less real than we think, but there's something we like about it because it's new. And here's the thing. Whenever something is new, there's energy that's built into it that gives us immediate momentum. We love the energy of new things. Some of this, this is why we go and buy things, because there's just this little little hit, this little endorphin hit we get from having a new thing. Some of your kids are totally like that now. You know, my son got a a video game system, and he was very, very happy, and it's a a Nintendo Switch. And we're sitting in our family room, and he's playing. He's like, Daddy, can we get a Sega? I was like, you just got a video game system. Like, live into that for a little bit. But it's just like there's something, he's up there like throwing his hands in the air. Literally, he's in the balcony. Sorry, son, I didn't realize you were up there. (laughs) No, he he literally was like, (laughs) so I'm sure I'll hear about that later. But we all, it's not just Tim, it's we all like the energy of a new thing. We all do. Some of you, you've gone from an old relationship to a new relationship And effectively, the only difference is that it's new. You're bringing the same thing in, you're being the same person, but you just have that shot of new energy, and it feels new, and it's fresh, but there's a point at which that begins to wear itself out. And there's nothing wrong with new things. There's nothing even wrong with owning multiple video game systems. But maybe this year... Maybe next year is not so much time to begin a new thing, but to stay faithful to an old one. Maybe this year that's coming up, it's not so much a time to just move on, and yes, there's some things we should start doing that we're not currently doing. But maybe what God is actually calling you to do is to stay the course to something that he's already called you to do to stay on the course of something that he's already put in front of you. Some of you know you need to do this. You need to stay faithful. Not maybe it's something you're doing, but it's some way that you have been called to be. It's something you've been called to be in a relationship or with a person or out in the world or in your family or in your job. And it's hard because it seems like all the energy is gone because it's not new anymore. But maybe what God is calling you to do is to stay faithful about that thing. You know, our culture, as I said, it's all about the shortcut. It's all about the new thing, the next thing. But we grow the most in the waiting. You hate when I say that. I hate to say it because none of us like it. But we grow the most. There's the opportunity for us to grow the most. Maybe that's a better way of saying it. In the waiting. And I think the thing that we all struggle with the most is, I actually believe that God intentionally makes us wait. He makes us wait on purpose. And it's for that reason. There's something that has the potential. It doesn't happen automatically, but there's something that has the potential to grow in us in faithful waiting that does not grow in us any other way. 
So there's something that has the potential. It doesn't just automatically happen, but it has the potential to develop in us. That doesn't happen any other way. When we wait, there's a space in which something can grow, and the, the question of the matter is simply, what is it going to be? So how do we wait well? Because none of us like to do it. I, I, I just hate it. I do not, I'm not a very patient person. Most of you have probably figured that out if you've hung out with me for any length of time. Where we're not just running down the clock. And here's what I think it is. I think it's in how we view it. Is waiting an obstacle that we have to get through? Is it something that we, it's like when you're at the restaurant and they give you the little buzzer thing that's shaped like a lobster and it's 45 minutes. You know, is it just an obstacle that you have to get through or is it an opportunity? Is it an obstacle or is it an opportunity? There's a couple of you in this room, you know, you, you just ended a relationship for whatever reason. And you're kind of looking ahead a little bit to the new year and wondering what it'll bring and maybe to the next thing and what it'll bring. Is that time an obstacle or is it an opportunity for you to work on you? Is it an obstacle or is it an opportunity? Because here's what happens with waiting. Waiting can either sap our will or it can heighten our expectancy or even our desperation. You know, sometimes when you're waiting, it's like, oh my gosh, this is taking forever. What's going on? Or there's the opportunity for it to heighten our expectancy. Think about the difference between waiting in traffic, which we all get to do at this time of year, or waiting for a, a family, a, a guest or a family member who arrived this Christmas. Think about the difference between those two things. They're both the same thing, but the difference is in how you view them. They're both waiting, but one of them is like, there's this thing that I've got to get through to get to the destination, and there's other, this other thing where it's like, I just have to get through this, but there's something on the other side of it that makes it absolutely worth it. It can heighten our expectancy. Sometimes it can even heighten our desperation. We do not use that word very much in our culture because we are large and in charge more often than we would care to believe. I have this saying, that I say periodically here in church, desperation brings incredible clarity to your life. You know, when you truly need something, when you truly have your eyes focused on something, it brings incredible clarity to your life. You know, I believe, and I wholeheartedly believe this here where we live. One of the reasons we live lives that lack purpose so often where we're just kind of bouncing from thing to thing or, you know, from job to job or from promotion to promotion or we got that house and now we're going to get this house and we had this car and we're going to get another one and maybe we're going to get a house down the shore or whatever it is. There's just this bouncing around that happens in our culture. It's not because we lack options. It's because we have too many of them. It's because there's too many things that we can put our attention to. And so waiting is this great clarifier. It's this great clarifier that allows us to really clarify what's really important, what really matters. And it can heighten our expectancy if we do it in the right way. And I think our passage talks about this as something we need to grapple with in our waiting. So don't be surprised if God's fulfillment of your waiting comes in unexpected packaging. Don't be surprised if the thing you're waiting for ends up not looking like what you thought it was going to look like. Don't be surprised if how this all plays out and how this all works out comes in a form that you would not have expected. Look back at our story. Simeon has been waiting for a long time. Anna has been waiting for a long time. The legend that everyone believed is that the Messiah was going to come and he was going to be this ruler who was going to kind of take the reins of Israel, kick out the Romans, and bring back the good old days. And we don't know how much of that those guys, Simeon and Anna, believed or not, but that was the dominant understanding. And instead, what shows up in the temple is a baby, a, a, a young child from a poor family. So there's this child that shows up, and it's not the royal anything that anyone would have expected. But it still lines up with the Word of God, it still lines up with the prophecies. 
It still lines up with everything that was going to be said. And so here's how you know. It may not look what you thought like it was going to look, but it will still line up with the will and the way of God. Don't be surprised if God's fulfillment of your waiting comes in unexpected packaging. Simon even prophesies this thing. It's another one of those passages we don't write a lot of Christmas songs about. He says the Messiah is not going to bring unity, but division. Jesus is absolutely polarizing. If you follow Jesus with your life in big ways and in small ones, it is a polarizing decision. There are things, there's ways of living, there's patterns of action, ways of thinking, even other things and other people who demand your ultimate loyalty that you will have to leave behind to truly follow after Jesus. And people around you will not get this at all. When we follow Jesus, it makes people go, huh? You know, it's one of the things in this area, in New Jersey, as we, we live in this very affluent, fast-paced culture that we're in, this very progressive culture, if you will, is most people are not, apo- they're not opposed to religion. They're not opposed uh, to the teachings of Jesus. But when we actually follow them with our lives, people go, wait, really? You're going you're gonna to do that? That's how that works out? It will lead you in a direction. And in terms of God's fulfillment of awaiting, being unexpected, there's a part of the text here that I I don't want to skate past. I don't want to just, as I said, make this a moralistic sermon about the best things come to those who wait. Speaking to Mary, Simeon says some pretty difficult words. He says, a sword will pierce your own soul too. And what he's talking about there prophetically is as the mother of Jesus she will feel the loss that comes when Jesus ultimately goes to the cross and is crucified. When we step into God's purposes for our life, there's pain that comes with that as well. Now, don't don't get me wrong. I believe the payoff is absolutely worth it. I believe that when we follow after Jesus, it is your best life now and later. But when we step into that, it's not just all up and to the right. There's a cost that comes with it. There will be pain. There will be loss, even mourning. And sometimes we won't even understand why or how. But what it is, is it's the acceptance of the right pain. It's the acceptance of the right pain. You know, we're not masochists. We're not just here to kind of get knocked around in life. But there's things that come. Our culture has taught us that pain is bad. That if you're experiencing pain in any way, that it's a bad thing. You know, pain is an indicator, whether that's emotional, whether that's physical. It's an, it's an indicator of something. And it can be a bad thing, but it's not always a bad thing. Think of those of you who exercise. You know, when you do that the second day or the third day, you don't just go out and you're like, yes, this feels awesome. Because it doesn't. But it's leading you to something that makes it worthwhile. And the difficult word I want to speak for some of you today is you're experiencing pain in your life in whatever form. And the temptation is to believe that that pain is because you're doing something wrong. The temptation is to believe that what you're experiencing is because you're not doing it right or you're not doing it well enough, you know, or maybe God is, he's unhappy with you or however you want to fill in that blank. It may be because you're doing something absolutely right. And it's part of, of the process. So it's receiving it. And yes, it's navigating it well. Some of us, and I'll I'll just raise my own hand here, have had a year where we've received a lot of difficulty that we now have to navigate. We've received it. Now we have to figure out what we're going to do with it. And we have the opportunity because of the power of God in our lives to navigate it well. And so Simeon, 
dedicated his whole life to this thing. He held out until it happened. Anna experienced loss, filled that hole with purpose, and waited. And at the end, Simeon basically says, Lord, you can now dismiss your servant in peace. What he's basically saying is he's saying, I'm good, I can go now, this was absolutely worth it, even if in the whole long middle of it, it didn't seem like it was. And as we come to the end of this year, as we come to the end of our time together, remember why these were written as songs. Like I said, that little song of Simeon, that was one of the songs of the early church, just like we sing some worship songs here in church. The early church sang these songs, and the reason that they sang them is because it helped them remember what was true. So they sang these songs to remember what was true about God, because in the midst of all of it, in the midst of the waiting, in the midst of the waiting where it feels like there's pain in the waiting, it very easily feels like it's not worth it. We very easily look around other people and we say, you know, they're not experiencing this thing. I've been holding out for this thing. I don't know if it's ever going to come, walking in God's will, God's way. I just don't see it. It's a reminder, and this song is a reminder that we all need to remember that the waiting will be worth it. The waiting will be worth it. So as you approach a new year, what are you dedicating your life to? Is it worth it? Will it be worth it? Will it be worth it? Here's how you can check this, by the way, because that's one of those big open-ended questions where, like, I don't know how to answer that. Time travel in your mind to the end of whatever that thing is. Some of you have a whole lot of little kids right now, or you have some teenagers, and you're just like, I don't know if this is worth it. I don't know if prioritizing this is worth it. You know, I could go work more and make more money. And here I have these kids at home which you know, may or may not be thankful that I'm actually here. Time travel to the end of that and look back. Some of you are committed to doing a relationship the right way. And it seems like you're pushing off and you're holding off and you're, you're denying yourself some things in the present. Travel to the end of that and ask yourself if it's worth it looking back. Some of you, you know, you're building this relationship with God and it takes time and it takes effort and there's so many other things that are competing for your attention that you could be doing. Travel to the end of that and look back. And ask yourself, is it worth it? Here, here, here's a difficult one. Some of you feel like you're experiencing loss in your life right now, and you're experiencing it so that someone else can gain. There's this thing that you're carrying so that someone else doesn't have to. Look back at the end and say, is it worth it? A couple of you in this room, you've embraced a new pattern. And it's a pattern that just is a lot of work. You said, I'm not going to live that way anymore. I'm going to live this way. And you're out of the energy of that initial out the gate, yes, my life is going to change kind of thing. And you're in the middle now where none of that exists, and it seems like it would just be easy to give up. Get yourself to the end in your mind and look back and say, is it worth it? Is it worth it for the people around me? Is it worth it for my kids? Is it worth it for what God might be up to in my life? And yes, a couple of you, this is about investing in you. This is about facing down something in yourself that is painful, that is difficult, that it just seems like it would be easy to keep rushing past and to keep going. But when you confront your brokenness, when I confront mine, even when we confront our own sin. We are doing it so that what we give to the other people in our lives is good fruit. 
And friends, that is absolutely worth it. Without keeping the perspective of the end in mind, when it seems like it's a long road, when no one else is doing it, and everyone else thinks you're a little crazy, just like Simeon, just like Anna, it's difficult to stay the course. But when we remember that, and when we remember that the presence and the power of God literally is waiting to get on that journey with us, can't wait to get on that journey with us, there's something that makes it worth it. Stay the course. Don't compromise. Don't give up. And don't give in. Because the end, even in the waiting, even as you wait, it'll be worth it. Let's pray. God, here we are at the end of another year. It seems like some ways the years travel so quickly. Sometimes they seem like they're just going on forever. I know in a room this size with this many people gathered and the, those who are watching online, it's a, it's a lot of different stories, a lot of different circumstances, a lot of different things that we bring into this last day of the year together. But the thing that you bring into all of those places is hope. Not just a hope that next year will hopefully be better than this year. Not just the hope that maybe things will change next year. But the hope of who you are. The hope of Jesus Christ. Who has come to raise dead things to life. To take broken things and to make them whole. The one who came into the hope of the waiting and made it worth it. And so for each person here, each person online, each person who may tune in later to this, I pray, Holy Spirit, in the way that only you can do, that you would, by the power of your Spirit, step into their hearts and into their lives and into their circumstance and into the ache of the waiting that they're experiencing, where they're holding on and they just don't see it. They don't see it yet, but they're still holding on. Jesus, we believe that you're worth it. And I pray that in a real way, we each would know that that is true. Give us the power and the strength to keep walking, to stay faithful. 